So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, statistical considerations in grant writing. So the idea there are, uh, when you and I mostly be thinking in NIH grants. That's kind of the experience I had, but certainly this applies to other stuff as well. Uh, so you can get uh, CME credit for it, but for that you have to fill out the evaluation form. Uh, and uh, this is our financial disclosures, people who organized and meet the speaker, uh, and we have no conflict of interest to disclose. Um, what I'm trying to tell you about in this uh, talk is uh, highlight what kind of, which parts of the grant application where statistics are relevant, so what are the statistical issues that come up, uh, point to some common mistakes and pitfalls that you can have and offer some solutions and work around what you, what you can do in uh, some situations. So what you, to pay attention and some tips about what you can do about that. Uh, and your evaluation forms that you can find in the back, you know, even if you're not getting CME credit, we would really appreciate evaluation forms because we would like to improve our uh, talks. So we appreciate that. So first uh, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about my grant-related background. Uh, because I will be kind of saying things that in my experience, so that's what I've seen, so you know how to put that in context. So, uh, so I'm a biostatistician, right? so I work most on the statistical aspects of the grant, and I've, uh, there are multiple grants I have been the co-investigator, usually the statistician, right, uh, on the grants, both basic science and human studies, including clinical trials. I wrote lots of statistical sections, and so lots of drafts actually, so many of the mistakes I see, hopefully I see them in the drafts and I don't pass them on further down the line. Um, and I also did some reviewing for NIH, both as a statistical reviewer on a clinical section, specifically this clinical integrated cardiovascular uh, sciences section, and also um, reviewing statistical grants. The BMRT section is the statistical section. So it's not a lot, but that, you know, I have seen some grants out there, so that's kind of the context. Uh, so the, I will be going through the issues that come up in the grant. And so a little bit about how to specify specific aims and hypotheses in the grant, uh, the study population, uh, how to define the study design, how to pick one what issues are there, how to define outcome measures, Mostly people think these are the last two as the statistical issues with sample si uh, with grants, right? How to calculate the sample size and the analysis plan. But we will be seeing that you know this is meaningless without thinking all through before. And of course, all these and I have separate sections, but they're all connected. There's a lot of interaction between this. So specific aims and hypotheses. So even though it's like not really statistics, but this is what drives everything else in the grant. So if you don't have your specific aims on, uh, in line, then there is nothing we can help you. So many times people come to us uh, for help with grants, and that's what we have to start back. OK, let's stop, and let's think, what are you trying to answer? And so all grants usually have a part that they say specific aims. And they are actually, from our point of view, often very vague. Uh, so even though they're specific. So you have to have some more specific hypothesis specified for which we can build a statistical analysis. You often, it's a good idea to actually put it in there, but you don't necessarily have to, but you have to have those quantifiable specific hypotheses in mind before we can tell you how, you know, how to analyze your data or how many subjects you are going to need. So a specific aim might say that, you know, we will explore the effects of this drug on something, or will characterize something to properties. That's that's good for a specific aim, but exploring effects is not enough for uh, to do a sample size calculation. Uh, for a hypothesis, you will need to know that this treatment X Y Z, we hypothesize that it increases this and decreases that, or doesn't change that, or you know, like very being very very more, more specific than a specific aim. Uh, and it's actually very helpful if you can actually hypothesize not just that it will change something, but you know, that it will increase it as opposed to decrease it. Right? So, uh, 
So you have to have those in mind. That's kind of the first step you can, you know, you have to think of that before you probably, uh, if you come to a statistician, you know, you have to have that before coming, right? Uh, and, but uh, one point is that if you're ever stating your hypothesis in your grant, you have to make sure that you state your working hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, the thing that you think is true, and not the null hypothesis. I sometimes see people stating the null hypothesis, the null hypothesis that nothing will change. Well, you write it, you know, unless it's something exciting, usually you don't write a grant about that, right? You're, you think that it's gonna change, right? So that's what you write down. Um, so, the next step is to specify your study population. And in statistics, we always talk about the target population and the actual sample that you take out of the population, uh, the actual measurements you take. But really, I think there are, in this case, at least one other level of population. So you have like a conceptual population, like people with prostate cancer that I want to study, or, uh, or people with newly diagnosed prostate cancer, to be more specific, okay? So that's a still a uh, conceptual population. You need to give definitions of it, how, what exactly are you going to mean in this specific grant, right? So like to give operational definitions. So for that, you need to say exactly inclusion, exclusion criteria, and that's, again, not exactly statistics, but there, are, you know, again, you have to be very specific because otherwise we cannot uh, interpret the results. So how do we, you will know that this person has a prostate cancer or doesn't have a prostate cancer exactly, or what other thing that you want to, how do we know who is eligible, who is not eligible? Uh, how will you get uh, the subject, so uh, you maybe you're interested in all patients with prostate cancer, but you're not going to approach all of them. You are not even going to sample all of them. Maybe you are going to sample those who present in your clinic, or maybe it's a multi-center study then at multiple clinics. But whatever, you know, you are going to have some smaller population really that you are going to be sampling from. Uh, but it could be, you know, from your biology, you know, you have some uh, with star rats that you are going to be obtaining from you know, provider XYZ, or you're going to raise them in your lab, or whatever, you have a population that you have to specify where are you getting exactly specifically what group you are studying, and as specific as you can. The more details you know, the more convincing you are that you actually know what you are studying. And then you always ha have to think about even how many subjects are potentially available in your study. So before even starting, you know, how many you need, you, have, you know, you have to kind of have some idea how many you could have. You know, usually people with rare disease, uh, studying rare diseases run into these problems that there are just not enough people. And so, but at least you need to know how many are there. Uh, and then we can calculate is that enough, and then we can later see maybe you have to have not the center side study maybe that you just plain cannot do it on one side. Uh, a part of the defining the study population is usually to define controls. So usually you have some group of interest and then you have to compare them to somebody. So the controls are really still part of the study population in general. Uh, and the ideal situation would be that they only differ from the subjects of interest in that uh, whatever variable you are manipulating or the effect of which you are interested in. So only the study variable. In practice, you know, this is, there's essentially one straightforward case when you can have that, if you are doing a randomized prospective study. That's why we do randomized prospective studies to begin with, because uh, we make sure that everybody is, uh, has an equal chance to receive the treatment, not receive the treatment. So we know by design that only Thing they're different is whether they receive the treatment or not receive the treatment. So, in fact, I think many basic science experiments fall into this category, right? You know, you take a bunch of animals or cell lines, and some of them receive the treatment, some of them not receive the treatment. Usually, you know, you don't think of that as a randomized prospective study, but that's what they are. And so that's yeah, that's why usually issue of control is less serious in there because if you are doing a randomized perspective, the control comes naturally. You have just to make sure that you have one, but it's relatively straightforward, usually. Uh, often it's tempting to use a subject 
as his or her own control or its control. Uh, but you have to be very careful with that because if you take a measurement before the intervention happened or whatever you're interested in happened and afterwards, uh, you are going often to see changes that have nothing to do with the effect of the intervention. Uh, so uh, this phenomenon is known as regression to the mean. And the uh, short story on that, that usually say, you are say, studying some drug as effect on hypertension. So you recruit subject with some blood pressure above 160 millimeters, say. Okay? It's a stolen blood pressure above it. And then you give them some treatment and measure them again. And lo and behold, the blood pressure goes down. And there, there are two reasons that it can go down. A, the treatment helped. And B, their blood pressure was variable, and then you just happened to capture them at the moment when it was higher than their own individual average. And so they went back to their typical mean, which is maybe actually only 145. You know, so and you're seeing 145 because that's what you would expect to see really for them. You just happened to capture them when they, for some reason, had above. If you had happened to capture them on a day that their blood pressure was 140, you wouldn't have included them in your study. So that's why those people who regress the other way, you don't see them. You only see the one that goes down. So, and really, in practical purposes, we use both things, right? You have the regression of the mean and the treatment effect, and you just can't separate them. So that, there are two ways to go about it. Uh, one of them is crossover designs. When you, uh, uh, so if you have, say, uh, you look at them with the treatment and without the treatment, but you put them in different order. So some subject, say, have one month the drug, one month no drug, and the other subject starts with the drug, no drug and go to the drug. And then the regression to the means kind of cancel out each other. You can adjust for that. But it's very rare, actually, that very few circumstances when this design works. Because it has to be some kind of measurement when there is no carryover effect. So treating them for months shouldn't affect their outcome, like not treating them the next month. And that's kind of rare. Typical chronic diseases that you cannot cure but manage are good examples. Like asthma studies like to do that. Because if you happen to cure them in the treatment period, you can't even study them in the second period because they are not eligible anymore. So again, good for the patient, bad for the design. So that's why. So crossovers are rare, but they are potential solutions. If you and the other solution is really to have a control group, right? To have, you know, so you might want to use the within person change as an outcome variable and then have a control group that doesn't have the treatment and you compare the within person change of those who had the treatment, didn't have the treatment, that's perfectly fine. Because both of them have regression to the mean, but only one have the treatment effect. But then, you know, you kind of didn't go around the issue of having controls. So you have you know, so you have to watch out for that the uh, within subject control. That that it doesn't necessarily mean what you hope it would mean. Uh, there are special uh, considerations for selecting control if you are doing a case control study. And we'll talk about the, this goes into the study design issues will come up later. A uh, case control study is when you select uh, subjects that are affected by a disease or have had a treatment. So they, as cases, uh, because there are relatively few of them and they are easy to find, and then try to find matching controls who didn't have the disease or the treatment or something like that. So uh, an example would be again when you try to uh, look at cases are somebody who has a certain condition and controls are those who didn't, don't, and you want to see uh, whether some variable predicts having that condition, for example. Uh, the problem is that how do you know who is an appropriate control? Because clearly, you know, they should, again, they should be as similar as possible, except having that disease. Now, usually diseases don't just stand alone, right? They're associated with all other things. And some, so for example, maybe older people will tend to get this disease, or it's associated with overweight, or with a certain ethnicity, or with some high risk, low risk behavior, whatever, right? 
So do you, how do you find people that are relevant, so they have the con uh, uh, variables that you're interested in kind of similar, and then the main condition, but one group has the condition, the other don't. And that is a very difficult issue, and that's why case control studies are really difficult. I can't tell you what the solution is for that. It's just that you have to really think about it, that always kept asking, what other things are my cases on control different in besides having the disease? And is it a problem? So some things we can adjust statistically for, but the less we have to adjust for statistically, the better it is for your design. Uh, one thing that people forget, often don't think about is that when you're talking about the condition, uh, presence of a condition, then the diagnostic process of that condition uh, might be very important. So prostate cancer, for example, uh, people who have a diagnosis of prostate cancer, of non-metastatic prostate cancer, their expected survival is better than a similar person, same age, same gender, same race, well, gender is the same, uh, that does not have a prostate cancer diagnosis. So a prostate cancer diagnosis is good for you. And that's because, not because prostate cancer is really good for you, it's the diagnosis that's good for you. And that's because uh, it's usually detected by screening. And to get a screening, you have to go to your physician. And if you are going to your physician and getting all kind of, you know, you have insurance probably, and you have all other things, you know, you're getting your blood pressure taken care of and your diabetes diagnosed, whatever, you have a good, much better care. And since it's not uh, early stage prostate cancer doesn't kill very fast, certainly, you know, there is, you know, the, all the other gains are better than the loss of the effect of the prostate cancer. So, actually, you know, it's, so that's it's not clear. You know, how would you who would be appropriate control for that? Because they do have better survival experience than if you don't. So you have to try to get people who kind of similar have the same screening factors. They could have been diagnosed if they have had prostate cancer. So maybe you would want to have again match people by you know at the time they get the screenings, and then see, look forward, those who get, get diagnosed and not diagnosed, that might be appropriate controls for some things. So it's very important also, how do you know that they have a condition, and how do you know that the control doesn't have a condition? Did you try to look for it, for example, or just it hasn't been diagnosed yet? Not, not necessarily the same. Uh, other common situation with case control is when you say cases who have received certain treatment, and the control of those who have not received a certain treatment. And then you want to see whether the treatment is effective. But again, this is not like prospectively, but looking backwards from retrospective data. Uh, and the main question to make sure about it is to, you have to know why did not the control receive the treatment? So I'm not a physician, and I would like to think that whenever a physician tells me that I should get this treatment, they have a good reason to do so. They don't do it randomly, right? So, and that's, um, I like that when a physician does that to me, but as a statistician, that's horrible that he had a reason because it's as far as the random assignment as possible, right? So, I didn't receive that treatment because I was not eligible to receive it really properly, or maybe somebody gets a more aggressive form of treatment because the disease works more aggressive, and it might, some of that thing might, or more advanced, right? It, some of those things might be captured some other variables in cancer, remember, stage and grade, whatever, but some of those, maybe just the physician's impression, looking at the patient, right, the other comorbid, whatever, other things that are going on, that the physician had a reason, he wasn't just tossing the coin, but this reason is not captured anywhere. So this patient will have a worse outcome, not because the treatment did or didn't do anything, but because this patient was going to have a worse or potentially better outcome, uh, regardless of whether he received the treatment or not. Right? So typically the better outcome is when the intervention says surgery. If the surgeon feels uncomfortable doing surgery on somebody, that probably means that the patient is not in a condition to tolerate the surgery. Uh, right? So then receiving surgery means better survival just because that person was able to receive surgery. So you would have to have to make sure that your controls are patients who could have had surgery, were eligible, but didn't for some reason, and not because they didn't get surgery, because the potential physician thought that they were not eligible to get that surgery. And the, 
difficulty usually in retrospective studies that it's very difficult to tell, right? Just looking at the charts, whatever. That. And so as soon as your cases and controls get uncomparable, you never know what caused any difference you saw. Was it the selection bias or was it the treatment effect? And maybe you don't see anything because the selection bias works against the treatment effect. You could have all kinds of things uh, coming up. So you really need to be able to identify who was even eligible to receive the treatment. And that's often very, very, very difficult. And sometimes it's totally impossible. So there are situations if, if the clinic has some protocols in place, what to do in this case, that case, that case. So for example, uh, we had somebody in, in infertility treatment. They had, you know, if something happens, then we do this. and if that event doesn't happen, we don't do anything. And they wanted to compare, they, they really didn't know whether the treatment they were doing was a good thing or not a good thing. So they wanted to compare people who had that treatment with people who didn't. But the only way you could have gotten the treatment if that event, specific event, before that happened. And so people who didn't get treatment weren't even eligible to get treatment. So it, it was impossible. So there were no controls to be had in the study, it just period. So they, you couldn't do that study certainly in one place. You know, maybe they could think about that, look at other institutions, may have different policies, and somehow from based on the differences in policies you can gather. But here they have one policy, one pr protocol that they do, and it completely, so again, having protocols is a good thing, but completely ruined their ability to compare these things retrospectively. So they couldn't do the study they wanted to do. So, you do, and these things you have to, again, think through and uh, you have to try to convince, you know, if you are planning for a case control study, whoever reading is the grant, that you are there actually eligible and you thought about the issues that could make them different. And you have to make sure that you acknowledge that yes, some things still, you probably won't make it perfectly. It's, again, unless it's a prospective randomized design, it's almost impossible to do it perfectly. But there are situations where can, okay, you can try to argue that yes, despite these issues, there is still, you know, we believe that it is, they are comparable enough. But you don't want the reviewer to come back with these issues that, well, you know, that they differ in so many things and you didn't even think of that. So in part, I think exposing these things explicitly is better because then they know that you thought about it, you are aware of the issues and not just forging ahead without thinking and without uh, knowing about these things. So we already uh, I touched on some of the issues with study design. Uh, so you certainly have to always think about right, whether you do a prospective study, which is certainly better, but certainly more expensive and time consuming and difficult usually. Or you can go with a retrospective but there, you do have much, many more issues in selecting everything appropriately. Uh, also, whether you are trying to do observational study, where you just look at what happened, right, or experimental, when you try to intervene. And again, obviously, most often the intervention, the experimental, is better, but maybe it can, will be down the line. At the very least, if you are planning an observation study, you can write down what kind of prospective uh, experimental study you can do in the future if the study is successful and shows benefits of so I think that could be always a good idea to say that, yes, it's not quite what we want to do, but once we do it, we will have enough evidence to do the real study. And you can describe the real study you would want to do. Uh, case control studies have some special issues with uh, study design, and usually it's whether we do matched or unmatched so even though uh, we want to have cases and controls to be similar in general, it doesn't. You could have either each case have an individual control belonging to that case that matches that case on everything except the presence of the condition or treatment, or you could have just the two population matching. They come to the same kind of people. But they, you know, it's not like one case goes with one control, or one case, you know, it just they are same, similar. So it's not like you're, comp 
matched means that your controls are comparable to their cases. That's a given. That should be, if you are doing the case control study, your cases should be comparable to your controls. The question, the matched unmatch is whether there's an individual level matching, and which could be not just one to one, but potentially one case could have two controls matched to it, but really individual, you know, who goes with who, versus just overall they're comparable. And the matching, so there's, there are arguments both ways, and sometimes one is better, sometimes the other one is better, and matching can gain power, but if uh, you're really, your matching is not working well, you're matching on variables that are not really predictive of the outcome, you can lose power for matching. So there is, it's not always that matching can do you anything bad. You can lose power, have to have more patience just because you matched. So, uh, but you also have to be very careful with the wording and the appropriate statistical analysis. That will come up later, but one of the common things is confusion without matched and unmatched. So you have to be very, very clear whether case control matched or case control unmatched but comparable controls. Uh, other issues that about the study design you have to describe is if you do any randomization and if you do any blinding. And randomization, so in a prospective study, you certainly you would like to, you know, prospective interventional study, you would like to do randomization. And it's good to describe how it's done. But in basic science studies, you know, where most of the studies are prospective actually studies, you know, People don't mention that they randomize or don't randomize. And I think that's a good thing, you know, randomization is almost always good, unlike matching, which is, can go two ways. Randomization is good. So if you uh, describe how you randomize who, which animal gets what, that's a good thing. Because that's a, you know, you're thinking about, and usually actually it's done, it's just not written down. The other thing is blinding, uh, that, uh, how it it's applies not only to prospective but to retrospective studies because pr you can blind the subject, right? And so with placebos and so on. And certainly, again, any efforts of blinding are major important for the subject. But even in studies where you cannot blind the subject or you blind the rush, you also have to blind the evaluators, hopefully. And that applies to almost any study. And certainly, animal studies are absolutely no exception. You know, if anything you can do so that whoever evaluates the slides or the animal status is not aware of what treatment that group the animal be um, belongs to, that's a really important thing. And there are lots of levels of blinding you can do in a basic science study and strengthen your proposal by saying that, you know, we are thinking of that, that, you know, that we don't want to include evaluator bias. And certainly, again, in clinical studies that's very important to also to make sure that as far as you can possible anybody who doesn't have to know what treatment was given shouldn't know it. Sure. About randomization. But if there's something that's a factor that you think might impact the outcome, should you stratify by that factor, say like a severity scale? Or should you just keep that factor as a covariate that you uh, so if, if you have a good, if you have uh, an important predictor, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, if you have like severity of disease, as you mentioned, that you could have uh, uh, several severities, you want to make sure that within each group of severity, both treatments are represented. So uh, if you just randomize by chance, unless you have a really big study, then it not, not, doesn't make a huge difference. But if you have a relatively small study, you could have by chance that all the severe cases, you know, 90% of them wind up in one group, 10% in the other group. And that's statistically valid, but very unpleasant situation to be in. So if you have, so stratification is a good idea if you are, if you have some really known important predictor. And there are lots of other options about how exactly to randomize. So there's a whole lecture to be done about how you can randomize. But you're right. So but once you stratify, you still include it in the analysis. So that's a, you know any variable you stratify, it you adjust for it in the analysis. So there is no contradiction there. Okay. But the other issue that but if you have lots of variables, you don't want to stratify by ten different variables. You know it should be like one or two major variables that are predicted, known strongly, and you want to make sure that they are balanced.
uh, some further study design issues is you can plan for an interim analysis. This is, you might have heard uh, them from clinical trials that, you know, whenever they run a big clinical trial, they check how they say, um, to see whether we already have significant results. So there's a big literature about how to do interim analysis. And I think this is, could be very helpful for smaller studies and not necessarily human studies. Because very often we have no, we have lots of uncertainty about whether we will have a big treatment effect or a small treatment effect. And uh, that's, you know, it will keep coming up in the sample size population that you kind of need to know how big treatment effect you would likely to have in order to know how many subjects you need. And if there's a lot of uncertainty, you can plan, uh, say, halfway through the study uh, analysis to test for significance. So uh, the idea is that you know maybe you plan for 100 animals, and after 50, if it's already statistically significant, not at the 5% level, you have to adjust the level, and there are all kinds of methods for them. But say at 1% level, it's significant. You can stop after 50. So if you are, have a really big effect, you might be able to stop earlier. And otherwise, you continue to 100. But you kind of have a potential for yourself to save animals, time, subjects, whatever you have, uh, in stopping earlier if you have an effect that's much bigger than you expected it to be. But you also, that if it's not as big, then you still have statistically valid way to continue. Uh, and again, this is very common in, lab, in clinical trials. It's, I've almost never seen basic science studies, but I think it could be really powerful and innovative. Right? Innovation is good to use this kind of things when you kind of are not really certain you want to save animals and time, but you don't want to close your, you know, not to have a significant result. So this kind of tries to play best of the both worlds. Uh, but it has to be planned in advance. In advance, you cannot do 50 animals and then come to me that oh, I want it to be the interim analysis. Sorry, that that. So you have to think of it in advance, and that's when you can do it. Have the opportunity to do that. You cannot do it one afterwards. Another approach to try to look uh, if you have lots of uncertainty about how, what's going on is to do an internal pilot study. And so here the idea is that we kind of know what effect size we are looking for, but we don't know uh, some other quantities that we need for sample size population. We'll see you need something like variance or some probability of success and so on. So there are, depending on what we are looking at, there are other things we need besides the effect size, the difference between the two groups. And if we have really no idea, then one way to do it is say, take the first 10 subjects, estimate those quantities we need, and then calculate the sample size and do the study. Now, the difference between an internal and external pilot, that in an internal pilot, uh, you, the, you can use the first 10 subjects in the final analysis. Because typically, what you do like a, a, a pilot study of say, 10 subjects, calculate the sample size, forget about them, and do the real study. That's like the typical classical thing. An internal pilot lets you reuse those subjects you use for the uh, sample size population. Now the difficulty is, or trick, that again, you have to plan in advance for it. You cannot just uh, do it in the middle that, oh, I didn't recalculate because I wasn't significant. Uh, and also, it, it, there is some cost. You have to adjust the significance level a little bit. So, you know, again, there are statistical methods to do it, but so maybe typically, maybe at the end, instead of a 5% significance level, you have to use a 6% significance level. There's a little price to pay, depending. So it's not a big price, but there is a price to pay for everything. Uh, so, but that also kind of a study design issue that one can plan for. Uh, again, all have to be done in advance, and if you do something like this, you better write it down in your proposal. These are all like setting up about issues about what to do with sample size calculation. Right? They are all trying to go around that we don't know how many samples we need. But we'll find it out along the way. Now, uh, so besides the study design, we need to tell, so what is our 
outcome variable, what are we actually measuring? What are we comparing? And it is, again, important to put it down in writing, so exactly what they are, and the reviewers are, uh, who understand the subject matter, they will have strong opinions whether this is the right thing to do, measure, or the wrong thing to measure, but you have to tell them what you are going to measure. Uh, and so, you ha and you also have to tell them exactly how, and reviewers will have opinions on that too, unfortunately, that, you know, what procedure going, you are going to use. And you have to write down as much of it as you can, that exactly what and how are you going to measure. Also, how often and at which time points you are going to measure it. Uh, one mm, common issue is that once you start a study, you really want to measure it everything lots of times on the same subject. It feels like, you know, once you have this subject, this animal, whatever, you want to do as many things as possible on that subject. And so one, people like, you know, let's measure something every day. And it sounds like a good idea that we have a lot of data, but sometimes the downfall is very difficult to analyze the data then, much more difficult if you have measured only a few. Uh, depending on how you analyze it, you can lose power because they st you start comparing every time point with every time point and then you have to adjust for multiple comparisons and nothing is significant. You cannot tell where the differences are. Uh, so if you, for example, if you're only interested to know whether something changed or didn't change, you, the most efficient design is just to have the two points at the end, at the very beginning and at the very end. You really, any point in the middle, essentially doesn't contribute anything to our knowing whether there was a decrease from beginning to the end. Now, if you want to know whether it's a linear decrease or maybe a sharp drop followed by a flat line or some other shape, you know, then you need the intermediate points if you really care about what happened along those lines uh, in the middle. But if you really care whether it changed, the intermediate points don't add anything. You know, you're wasting your measurements there. So, uh, you ha and then that's why it's important to know what your hypothesis is, right? So but do you really need those intermediate points or are you taking because you can? And so why not? Uh, uh, it's also very helpful if you can separate what outcomes are the, the primary interest and what are you measuring just as supporting information. And the reason is uh, that usually the sample size calculation is done on your primary outcome of interest. So we make sure that you have enough samples to do, answer the B question of interest, and for the other outcomes, you know, you either have or you don't have. You have some information about that, but you may have not enough power uh, for those analysis. But no, but it's not as important because it's not the important outcome. So that's why you need to be able to, you know, this is the outcome I really care about. And uh, you know, one, of, you know, primary could be not just one, maybe two. You know, but a very limited number usually. Uh, and so if you have multiple experiments in the grant, of course, each one could have a separate primary outcome. The whole grant doesn't have to have one primary outcome. But each experiment, uh, cell setup or study should have its primary outcomes. And you want, the primary outcome should be hopefully the one that is the most clinically relevant or biologically relevant. The one that if you were reading this paper, you would like to see. In. So what would you like to see if somebody else does it? You know, in human studies, it's often you know, survival or something like that. That's what we want to know. Right? So the real bottom line kind of thing. Uh, on the other hand, it, was some, it should be something that should likely show the difference. Uh, so you want to think about you know, how, what's the pathway your intervention or your study variable, how does it make a difference, what it really affects, so you want to kind of think that this should be something that's likely to be changed. So sometimes, you know, if a drug, say, uh, stops the progression of a tumor, you maybe want to look at overall survival, at progression-free survival as your primary outcome, because even the progression-free survival might in turn turn to overall survival differences, but the differences would be smaller. The biggest difference would be the, because that's the mechanism of action of whatever you are studying. And often, unfortunately, these are kind of contradict each other. You know, so the, it's, uh, it's rare that these are two conditions are the same, give you the same outcome. But you want to have as 
biological, clinically relevant as possible, but also the one that actually will be, you think, is the one that will be changing. Because that's, you know, you have some idea what should be changing, how this process works. Uh, so for sample size calculations, right, the most interesting part, we have you re, uh, different situations, depend, you know, different combinations of what you need for them, depending on what kind of study you have. So in retrospective studies, there are actually two potential options we can do, uh, you can uh, do the sample size calculation. So often there, actually the sample size is fixed, it's known, you know, if you have a database of things, you know how many subjects are there. So your sample size is fixed. You know. uh, if you, uh, so, and if, if that's so, uh, you know how many subjects are available and why, you know, you can use all of them. You can go both ways. Either you can uh, fix a uh, clinically or biologically important difference, uh, the effect size, you know, how big a difference I'm looking at, and then calculate what power you're going to achieve. And report that, you know, with this sample size, which we have, so we don't really have to worry about the sample size because we have, this is the database. The, and uh, we can, and this is the difference, we have 95% power to detect that. So we can go that way. Or we can say, well, we don't, not sure what's the difference uh, that we are interested in, but with this sample size and say 80 or 90% power, this is the kind of differences that we can detect. And then you can, you know, hopefully this will be not really, really big, but something clinically meaningful. But, uh, you know, I, we often use, you can use this the second approach. So you fix the power, you have the sample size, and you tell what kind of differences can we detect. So we can detect a twofold change or something, or maybe a 10% increase, depending on your sample size. And other. So you don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to compute the sample size, you compute the other things, but it justifies the sample size. It's really like sample size justification. In a prospective study, uh, the sample size is computed. So for that, then you do need uh, what is the difference you are looking for, and you do need what power you want to have uh, to detect that difference. And then we can. So this is like a classical sample size calculation. That you have the effect size, you have the power, and then you calculate with the sample size. Uh, and that sometimes you are doing uh, an observational study where you just want to have a descriptive nature, that you want to describe some what is going on, what are the characteristics of something, but without really a comparison, necessarily. So in that case, uh, the standard uh, power calculations don't apply because they, uh, they are designed with differences in groups. So what you can do is, so there is no power to applicable, but you can say that what kind of precision you want to do, to have at the end. So for example, when you're developing a new testing procedure, you can say, well, based on this many patients, we can estimate the sensitivity and the specificity with a standard error of 5%. So we will know that up to an error of 5% what the sensitivity is. So that would be uh, an observational study because they're not really intervening, right? You just want to know what the sensitivity and specificity are and we can, you can calculate the sample size based on precision. Yes? For a, a retrospective study with a fixed known sample where you wanted, you have to do matching, like kids in one school getting a treatment and kids in another school not getting it, how does your decision about the match, one to one or two to one, how does that relate to sample size calculation? Uh, so, words, your sample size decide? formula has to take into account this matching, mm -hmm. and there are ways to take into account the one-to-many matching. In general, um, one-to-two gains something, one-to-three might gain something, going beyond one-to-three, unless you have so many controls and they are so cheap for you to measure, it's unlikely to gain anything. You, sometimes you have case, situations where you know, adding extra controls doesn't cost you anything, essentially. And then you, know, you can do as many as you want, but really I don't think beyond one to three or two even, you gain much. But there are formulas for that, uh, to calculate the power of what happens. 
Actually, I have a related issue here about biological versus technical replicates, because uh, it's a little bit like that, that. When you're calculating sample size, you can have sample sizes on different levels. You know, like you can have different animals, but then within animals you can take different samples, say. Or schools and, you know, number of schools and how many, or children per class, you know, or... So there are lots of ways you can come in where you have different levels of sample size. This. And really, you really want to spend your effort on the largest source of variability. That's kind of the general rule, where the most variability is. But typically, it's the bio highest level of replication, but usually the biological, the person, the person, the animal to animal. And if you have animal rats, say, you know, all from the same litter, it's certainly not within litter, it's between litter to litter. Uh, so the highest level is variability is usually the one that is has the most uh, variability, the highest level of replication. And within that, uh, usually, again, there is a formula to try to adjust for it, to do exact calculations, but usually, again, beyond three, you rarely gain anything that's worthwhile, unless it's really cheap to do those within uh, subject replicates, and sometimes it is. But uh, it is, if that's the costly part, you certainly you want to waste your time on different, different subjects, different animals, the high level replication. The more you can get there, that's the better. The low level are less important. Uh, so to do uh, the sample size calculations uh, that I showed before, you really need to do multiple, you have to have as an input multiple things. So you need to have a plant analysis method. So you cannot just do a sample size calculation by itself for a comparison. You need to know, are you going to use a t-test? Are you going to regression? Are you going to use a non-parametric test? A non-parametric test will have a different power than the parametric test. So you actually have to know the actual test. Now, they, sometimes the result might be similar, but really the power calculation even has to specify what analysis are you going to do, not just what things are you going to compare. You also have to specify significance level, which is usually 5%, but doesn't have to be. Uh, and the power, which is again often 80% or 90, but doesn't have to be. Uh, if you ever see a sample size calculation when power is not mentioned, then you know usually something is fishy. That's the first sign of a fishy uh, sample size calculation that nobody mentioned the power. Uh, but, and these things, absolutely have to go in there into the grant written down what is the what test was you assumed what is the significance level what's the power what effect size is being uh, are we looking for and usually sample size calculations need additional information not just uh, the effect size but either the variance of the uh, if it's a normal distributed variable what's its variance if it's proportions, not just the difference between the, the proportion, but we need the actual proportion, say the control group. Uh, you know, if it's repeated measures, then the correlation between the repeated measures comes in. So there, are, and those have to be specified when you write down a sample size calculation, because essentially you have to specify it so that somebody who comes in and wants to reproduce it, they can reproduce your sample size calculation. When I review grants, you know, I usually, you know, plug it in, sit down and plug it in. It's usually very simple, you know, I just, and see whether I get the same sample size. And if my sample size is way off, that's of course a huge red flag that something's wrong. Uh, or if they don't tell me all the assumptions, then it's also kind of, did they know that they needed additional assumptions or didn't they know that they needed, I know they had to make for so, and this is where usually we have a problem that those additional, some additional things that we need to know, we might not know them. And that's when, say, an internal pilot study say, comes in, that you are trying to estimate those. Uh, so, how do you get those nuisance parameters? We usually call them nuisance parameters because they are not directly relevant to the, what we are interested in, which is the effect size, but we need to know that. So, they are a bother, a nuisance. So again, variance of measurements, probability of event, relation. And the source of these estimates, most preferably, the best source for that is preliminary data. So, right? Yeah, every grant should have, or almost every grant, should have preliminary data in it. And this, you know, when you're 
planning your preliminary data, it's really good to think about it, that one purpose that you will, would need that preliminary data is to make sample size and power calculations for whatever you're going to do in the draft. And if there's any way to do something similar to what you are planning to do, take some relevant measurements, and it doesn't have to be statistically significant. You know, if you have a statistically significant result in your preliminary data, then why you're applying for a grant, right, to do more of that. So it's okay if whatever you're measuring is not significant, but it gives you data to do, to plan the study that you're actually going to do. So. When you are planning your preliminary studies, it's really, if you can anyway do that, that is the best way to get those nuisance parameters. Uh, other sources, literature review, other people hope, often have done something similar, not in the same animal, not in the same circumstances, you know, whatever, but they have done something along those lines. And maybe you can look their paper and look the, uh, their variability. And Hopefully they wrote it down into the paper, but this is like you can do a favor for other investigators by putting in when you're publishing some of this information in of your uh, studies. That what was the standard deviation of the key quantity? I know everybody, may, you know, it's really painful to look in the plot and try to measure with the ruler the error bar and then put it next to the axis and try to guesstimate, you know, how much is that. And then was it the standard error bar, standard deviation bar, and what was the sample size so I can calculate the standard deviation? And there, I saw a paper that that's what it does, that writes down tricks of how can you figure out from what people actually publish, like from p-value or something like that, how can you figure out the standard deviation? You know, so you, it's so much nicer if we don't have to do that. And you know, somebody actually tells it. And some papers do that, so be nice and you know, publish. It's, the key things, you can actually put it in the text as a number. Nobody will stop you. And that's very helpful. But, uh, so that's the other source of data is literature review. And sometimes it's educated guess. That's also better than nothing. Usually you have some idea, especially things like probability of the event in the control group. You know, if I don't do the treatment, what proportion of the subject will have whatever. You have some idea about it. That's an educated guess. That's better than nothing. But really, if you have preliminary data, that trumps everything. It's the best. So some fallback options if you don't have the previous uh, the good things that you could have. So you, uh, you could say that if you have no room to put things in and nothing, you can say that the sample size calculations will be done by this person. And we have attached a letter of support. This takes like half a line, right? Or maybe one line. And at least you have shown awareness that sample size calculations are needed. You know, this is the worst thing you can do. But if you have lots of experiments and you don't want to write down the sample size calculation for every single one of them, then this could be a potential option. You can have an AIM-1 plan some pilot study that will help you do the sample size calculation for AIM-2. So I think that would be a very reasonable way to do it. Again, not if your whole study is one clinical trial, it's your whole grant, that's it, you know, then it doesn't apply. But, you know, if you have lots of little pieces that kind of go together, I think that's a very, very reasonable way to do it, that you can, you can give a preliminary calculation, but you say, you will update this result based on the better data that we will get. And again, maybe who will do it. You can plan an internal pilot study, as I pointed out, that where you will re-estimate in the middle of the study. Uh, also, the, uh, you can refer to some standard effect size quantities that uh, are usually called Cohen's effect sizes. And what they are uh, is uh, standardized effect sizes that are defined in several different situations. Here I'm showing them for continuous and binary data. But for continuous data, the effect size is the difference in mean divided by the common standard deviations. So how many standard deviations apart are the two groups? That's the standardized effect size. The actual effect size is the difference in the mean. But this is the standardized effect size. For binary data, the formula is really, really, really ugly, sine inverse of square root of one probability minus the other. And there are some mathematical reasons why it, but 
it doesn't have any meaning, but this is the standardized back size. So once you calculate that quantity, and you see you need the mean dif difference in means and the standard deviation or the two pr uh, probabilities for this. So you do need the nuisance information. But once you have that, you can say that uh, there's you know that uh, the effect size of 0 0.2 is small, and the effect size of 0 0.5 is medium, and the effect size of 0 0.8 is large effect. So those are and I added the very large with the star because that's not common. That's just I added another one, that's me, 1.5 and a very large effect. Okay. And so next, so once you have so those effect sizes, then from that we can do a sample size calculation. And if you have a 5% power and 8, sorry, 5% significance level and 80% power, then here at the bottom I have the formula for if you are comparing two groups, then it's approximately 4 divided by the effect size squared. So it's approximate, it's not quite good. You will see it doesn't exactly match up the correct calculation, but it's close. Uh, so you know, uh, the table shows you the actual sample sizes you would need. So for a small effect, you need, you need like 400 almost per group. So those are the big, big clinical trials, the kind of like, this is a small effect. Right? So, and, but for a very large effect, you know, eight per group is enough. So. This would be saying uh, often in the retrospective study when we had fixed effect, fixed sample size, we'll say fixed uh, power, and we'll say, well, we will be able to detect an effect, a standardized effect size of 0 0.2, which is considered a small effect by Cohen's standardized scale. You know, so that you can see that you can detect small effects because it's a huge database. So uh, examples of these effects you know, are so for normal data, it's very simple. You, know, you assume a standard deviation of one, so then the effect size is just the mean difference. So I try to think of standard deviation of one mean difference from 3 to 3.2. And on the next page, I have plots of that. You know. These are two normal distributions, standard deviation of one, that differ by 0 0.2 in their mean. You can see that there is a huge overlap between those. That's really a really tiny effect. Right? The means are different, but major overlap. Right, so even an effect size of 1.5, there, they, there is quite a lot of overlap between the two populations. So, but for those 0 0.2 effect size, you really need a lots of data to separate that. And you would think that you would never look uh, at an effect size like that. And probably with normal data, that's rare. But with binary data, it's very easy to get a very small effect size. So, for example, the effect size of 0 0.2, the difference between 10% and 17%. Uh, event rate, that's, uh, that's a small effect size. And, you know, if you have a treatment that uh, increases the chance of some of survival from 10% to 17%, you would certainly want that treatment, right? That's a huge effect in terms you know, for binary, but uh, statistically, that's a small effect. So there is a, you have to be careful, right? So with binary data, you can say you have, you know, to be detectable like with eight, you have like a difference between 10% and 75%. That's not just very large, that's overwhelmingly really huge, right? But uh, in normal, that's a more, a quite a realistic difference. Because you saw the curve, there still overlap between the normal distributions and they per group is enough. So again, this kind of, if you really have no idea uh, what your mean standard deviation are, you can have vague things that, you know, a small effect or a large effect is detectable. You don't need the nuisance parameters because based on the standardized effect size, you can get the sample size. And it has a name, it's a large uh, One, uh, sometimes we think the way to think about it is that if uh, the reason you want to look at the two groups is to develop a classification rule to use this measurement to predict which group you are in, then this measurement is only helpful if there is very little overlap between the two groups. So like in the case of the standard effect 0.2, there is no way that that measurement, even a statistical significant, can be used to predict which group the person is in, right? So if you want to ever use it in prediction, you have to have 1.5 or something like that, at least. So that's why if you are trying to test something, is it going to be useful prediction, you can argue, well, we need to have little overlap, so very large effects of a low sample size. If we cannot detect it with a low sample size, there is no way that it's useful in prediction. 
for uh, classification. So that's uh, sometimes a, a justification. Uh, in general, sample size should be done with software. And we'll have an upcoming talk about sample size software. There's a program called GPAR3, that if you search for it, it's a really nice program. It's free. It needs some statistical knowledge, but uh, it, it's, it's really understandable, I think. I really like it. And, you know, that's the time to consult your friendly neighborhood statistician, because it's easy to mess up a sample size population. But we have the software to do that. So it's not difficult if you have the software, just you need to understand what's put into it. And for statistical analysis plan, actually, it's very important, but I think not for grant proposals. So you have to have some plan, but your main point is to convince the reviewers that you know what you are doing. So you don't have to put in all the details. You really want to show awareness of things that are uh, important and the capability to address those things. So uh, you, you don't necessarily have to write down every single detail there. And you, one way, if you have lots of little experiments, you can say that write a generic section about statistics one way that we will be using t-test and linear regression and ANOVA as appropriate, right? And for match data, we will take into account the pairing, you know? And so like a very generic statement that you know that you can do it. And the other point that I recently realized that you would think that you don't have enough rule for, room for statistical uh, analysis plan, but there are sections in the grant proposals that don't have page limits. And specifically, the human protection of human subjects and vertebrate animal sections don't have page limits. And if sample size population and analysis plans are not about protecting the animals, right, and ethical treatment of them by not using too many or too few, I don't know what is, right? It really goes into that. We recently submitted a grant which had, a, you know, the protection of human subjects was five times as big. It was a cl major clinical trial, but it was five times as big as the grant, which is 12 pages. You know, so we, that's where, you know, in the grant we had like two paragraphs about statistics and the uh, protection of human subjects, we have five pages. So that's, there is a lot of room if you really feel the need to put details, you can just sneak it in in different ways. Uh, and also, the facilities and other resources section has no limits, and that's when you can describe what statistical consulting services are available and so on. So that's another place that you can show that you have availability of this uh, resource. And data collection forms can go, there's an appendix, and it's legal to put data collection forms there. And just last slide, some common mistakes that I kind of already mentioned, but some things that really uh, make a bad impression is if you have a complicated data that certainly is beyond t-test and, and sim very simple statistics and there is no mention of statistics or a statistician anywhere. You know, that immediate question, so how do you have the expertise? So you have to make sure that you show that you know that it needs to be analyzed. Maybe you don't even know that it's not simple. Uh, mistakes, misinterpretation, the preliminary data analysis, that screams that you don't know what you're doing because you couldn't even do it there. The preliminary. So there is, you absolutely have to make sure that the preliminary analysis is put on correctly. Uh, when the statistical methods do not match the study design, and I've seen two ways of happening that. One is you take a statistical section, copy paste from another grant, because it worked there, and then I read it and I see that you know there are verse there that just don't even make sense in the context of this grant you're planning because you didn't understand what you there. That's horrible. Okay. And the other way it can happen is when a uh, statistician writes something and then the grant change and the statistician is not told and it's not get updated. So a typical example of that is, you know, you have an unmatched analysis and a match design described, otherwise they describe, oh, we'll do matching because the last minute they said, oh, it's a good idea to match by age and gender. And they don't mention it in the analysis because they don't realize that the analysis should know that. You know, that's also an unpleasant thing to have when the two things don't match. And incorrect statistical plans uh, sometimes, you know, I've seen people write essential that we will keep collecting data until it becomes statistically significant. <laughs> now, some people I know do that, and it's very bad, but you certainly don't put it down into a branch, okay? Or anything that essential does that, that, you know, we look at five experiments, if it's not significant, we do five more, 
So just, you know, even if you do that, okay, to never ever write that down, okay? You shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing some other internal analysis or whatever formal, but no, don't write that down. And the other issue is when you kind of, uh, you write a plan that un uh, mentions superficial details that are not really important and doesn't mention at all the important part. And sometimes I know that's difficult to see what's important, what are the important issues, and what are not the important issues. But kind of, you write something about the statistics, but it's totally, don't, doesn't touch on the key parts of actually what really matters in the statistics, so it's difficult in it. So that's also uh, something to watch out for. Okay, I think that was it. Yes, sorry for running over the time a little bit. Uh, I'm available for questions unless somebody wants to kick us out. And also, just we have downstairs right now the uh, by statistics poster session right under us. If you want to look at the kind of things the research people are doing with by statistical help, but it's really not about by statistics. It's about uh, projects, actual studies.